Deary me, you guys. Hi there. She's naked. Almost. <laughs> it's just that it's over 30 degrees again and it's not even 12 o'clock yet. Um, but I just had to come on because it's on my mind for some reason. And um, so this is just going to be a general uh, chat, I think, about some of my background uh, things that have to do with the subject um, in question. Yes, there it is. Runes. So that's a Sula rune right there. So my books, I've got a couple of books right here and I am watching a channel that's helping actually quite a bit. Uh, Jackson Crawford, who's um, a real academic. Oh God, and it's been such a long while since I had the opportunity to, um, you know, engage with that type of material. So, um, in the order of things, the funny thing is a dream, really. I just want to get that off my, off my chest for a bit. I dreamed that I still had my fairly substantial van that I used to drive around in uh, as a delivery person and uh, sales rep for the incense company. Um, only I dreamed of the van, I brought it to a mechanic uh, to have something looked at and I came back the next morning and they actually reversed my gearbox inside the van. I don't even think that's possible. But in order to go forward, you had to just, you know, go... The, everything was just like 180 degrees around. Silly! So then I was like, for the past half hour, why am I dreaming this? What kind of sense does this make? Other than it links... The, the van obviously links to the work, to the type of work and the type of atmosphere and the type of... Um, you know, the atmosphere, the thought process, it's the priorities, basically, that used to be attached to working there. And then there's what I do nowadays, which tends to be more or less 180 degrees in the other direction. Yes. So, <laughs> in order to go forward, you know, it's like you know, through the looking glass. It's, it, yeah, it's very confusing. So I thought, on the other hand, other than that fact, which is absolutely a fact and my life is, you know, I am really focusing and prioritizing, um, you know, getting back in touch with my emotions in ways that I don't care what really has to be done. I have to get to know those emotions, right? In all sorts of ways. And everything I do, including tarot and oracle and all the rest of it, has to do with that. So, the other thing being that I've been working with runes again. It could be that the dream also applies to that and potentially applies to both even. Because in a way, what I've been thinking about definitely is the different approaches between the academic uh, working with, you know, historical material and the uh, witchy pagan approach to the same thing. So I've been trying to tell myself that what I know, let me go backtrack a bit first before I finish that sentence. Um, I used to, I, I have studied English language at university in Amsterdam back in the late, middle to late 80s. So that puts it back a bit, right? Before the internet, before the smartphones and all that, I was actually for seven years uh, in university over there. That's where I met my husband, who was also a student of English Lit at the time. And uh, at the time I was studying to the extent that I was actually doing anything because lazy Leo, you know, um, historical linguistics. So the development of language as we know it nowadays are from older versions and basically studying a lot of texts in 
Old and Middle English. So Beowulf and that type of thing, you know? I still like that stuff. And I've been wondering, I've been kind of reevaluating what with, you know, books that I apparently still have in my bookcase. Here's another one. They're both in German. Um, these are study works from my last year at university where I actually took up runology. So that's a subject that you can study. I think there was a year back then, maybe it's not even uh, a course they give nowadays anymore. Although it was fairly popular, I don't know, when I was in there, there were at least um, seven, eight, nine different other students other than myself. We had a great professor, he was, a great, he was a lot of fun, and he knew everything about everything back in the, you know, about the Vikings. And But that was just one subject matter, okay? For me, it's been kind of loosely attached to be a wolf and Old English and Middle English texts and all the rest of that. And I've never really... Because then what happened to me was I stopped all that short and I decided, hang on a second, there's the phone call alarm again in my brain. Hang on a second. That worked. That worked. Hallelujah. So I put the phone on silent mode. So what happened last time won't happen again. Okay, because ugh, I was in the middle of my, you know, nice, interesting ramble and beep. <laughs> That's not going to happen to me again. So, but I can actually pause the recording, thingamajig, and then press, uh, you know, scroll down a little screen that has the options for, um, for the sound or the ringing or the silent mode for the phone. So that's happened. We're going to be able to talk without any necessarily any other interference, okay? From within the machine. Where was I? Um, I shifted to English literature as well because what the problem was with linguistics, the way it was uh, given to us and what I could tell very soon was there was really, for me personally, there was no future in it. It was disappointing, really, because I had spent, I suppose, four or five years or so of those seven, uh, quite a lot of me was engaged with this very old uh, medieval or even older material. And now, now that I'm sitting here talking to you, and I've been thinking about this for the past 24 hours, I actually realize that my older choices made sense in a way, that there is material in there that I can still do something with. And there was a reason why I picked that subject matter and that's those courses back in those days. So, uh, but I had to abandon it because there was no job perspective, hardly any at all. And I was, I just wasn't good enough and I wasn't like, single-minded enough, you know, at that level, in order to graduate and get a post-doctorate or whatever type of a really, a position, a job of any kind, even just a few hours a week, even, you know, uh, in those fields, in the fields of linguistics, historical or otherwise, um, you have to be utterly single-minded, you have to work your butt off, basically, which wasn't really my deal. I was just generally interested in my academic career, whatever that means, you know, for me, my student career was always marked by the fact that I was interested in everything. I wanted to learn everything about everything a bit. And I just want to, I'm a kind of a humanist, you know, I just want to nibble at everything and just sit here and talk to you guys, basically, comparing this and that and, you know, approaches and it's like the Italian Renaissance. I'm, l I'm going to Italy, yes, in a, a week and a half, less than that. Actually, a week and two days, we will be off with our tent and first going to France and then on to Switzerland and finally to hopefully uh, land in the neighbourhood um, of the Veneto in the north of Italy, just in between parentheses here. I'll be visiting Venice for probably the third or the fourth time and I'll be going to see one particular painting. That's my reason for going to Venice. So, 
I'll be probably recording, if I can, I'm not sure that's allowed, I'll be recording a tiny snippet of that and uh, posting from uh, whenever I get Wi-Fi, you know, I'll try to post little bits of things from whatever. So, but that closes, closed, let me close that parenthesis because it's going to happen. I'm crazy about the Italian Renaissance. I'm crazy about uh, human anatomy. I'm crazy about birds. I love anything to do with nature. So I'm a really interested in poetry and all sorts of types of poetry. So, you know, there's no end. I'm a real gobble it all up type of person. So for, for the, the, the level of almost fanaticism is the word that comes to my mind. The word you have to to the exclusion of everything else, focus on your subject matter, and that was never going to happen. So um, what I felt like was that choosing English literature at that point, English-American literature, was going to be a lot easier for me, and I was going to be able to get something done, finish the studies, uh, write a script, you know, um, some kind of a paper, an end paper, for my studies, which I ended up doing on Virginia Woolf. That was excellent as well. I love doing that. That was um, that was quite fine. So that's a whole completely different ball game and but I did have to abandon the runology, Beowulf, um, all the lovely uh, studying of the manuscripts that I was that I'd been doing, you know. And the manuscripts, I got to that bit through Lord of the Rings. So that's what I've been, that's what I've been reading uh, all through my, um, you know, um, puberty years, I think. My young teenage years. I've been reading The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings um, on and off. And I was... If you had, if you asked me back in those days, what do you want to do that's really of a deeper interest to you? I'd end up talking about something to do with manuscripts and or runes even. Because that's what Tolkien had opened my eyes to, basically. Even though his runic alphabet is, I don't know, a concoction of his own. And he just made up that, he just made that up out of what he needed for his stories, right? But there's a lot in there that actually involves material that is really, um, you know, old Icelandic or Viking Age poetry and mythology. There's a lot in Lord of the Rings that's really bringing back to life that type of material. Now, I am not in any way a Germanist uh, uh, necessarily, I don't necessarily feel enthusiastic about um, Norse gods or Odin or any of those mythological frames of mind. That doesn't appeal to me. What's appealed to me back then and what still appeals to me is the divination um, approach, right? So the runes, and I've been reading up a bit also on the internet on that, and it turns out that the there's actual historical proof or documentation, I should say, evidence that the runes were used for divinatory purposes, probably in ways that can be compared to ours, I think, in the sense that um, I think they were definitely used for, uh, you know, casting the runes had to do with, you had a question about the outcome as to one particular situation or a question. You were asking the gods back in the day. So if you go into this stuff, okay, <clears throat> sorry, I have to have a gloop of tea. I had my coffee already, which is why I'm awake, sort of. And how, to the extent that's possible, being awake with 35 degrees out there, uh, which is, I think, over 90 or something in in, Santa, in um, Fahrenheit. It's hot. And it's just past 11. So that's going to be, it's going to be a couple of tropical days out there. So I'll be 
partly under the tree that you've seen already and I'll be partly um, just in here reading and stuff and watching vlogs about um, the poetry of the Vikings and before and after. So what I basically have been doing, let me see, I saw Lisa at Supportive Tarot's um, rune study uh, approach for this week. Actually, today is, I think, the 23rd, yes, of July 2019. So that was this week's activity for her. And it's kind of like it all came together for some reason. I've been wanting to get back into touch with uh, my rune studies um, for quite a long time because I felt like it was a missing part. I've never, I hadn't finished with that and I had to sort of bundle it all up and put, shove it in the attic and forget about it for, I don't know, 30 years, 25 years or so. And a lot of stuff has happened, but there's still, it's still all there. So I've got two of these two little booklets. This is the other one. Actually, this has more illustrations. There's uh, quite a nice one. Let me just try to show you what that looks like. The, those are actually sides at the bottom of a large uh, stone. And the top image is the same stone seen from the front, I think. Um, and this one is the other side. So the to the extent you could call it that, the back side of the same stone, right? And it's in Sweden, in Vestergutland, if I'm saying that right. It's um, an official rune stone, so it has a, an extensive inscription on all sides. These are historical. This is the historical database, okay? And this is what I've been investigating and reading up on when I was doing, studying rhinology. That's what I was doing. <clears throat> so there's loads more. There's another really famous one. The Frank's casket at the bottom right there. That has an image. I'm not sure this is focusing at all. Can you focus? Well, maybe it does. I won't be able to tell. The Frank's casket is another medieval uh, product. It's in the British Museum, at least at this stage. This is being uh, printed published it has images carved in some type of walrus ivory I think and there's an inscription all around on at least three or four sides of the casket so it's like a little box like so there's lots more um, coins and bones pieces of bone and all sorts of um, stone plates and objects with inscriptions from dating i think the oldest one that i've seen is from the fourth century a.d going on until even up into the 19th century what i read yesterday is that there were still objects being made and carved with letters similar to runes in the 19th century in um, in in uh, rural areas in sweden the alphabet or parts of the alphabet uh, were still being used in uh, in Sweden in the 19th century. So that's pretty extraordinary, right? And quite a number of these um, also have, I'm trying to show you this one, because it's got a, the one at the top has got like a carving in the middle. See that? So I'm hoping this will uh, kind of show up a bit. Not a lot of images, a lot of you know, the actual inscriptions being uh, sorted out and uh, translated to the extent that that's possible. It's not always possible. I'm also reading this one. They're both in, both in German. So, talking about shifting gear. Yes. <laughs> and here's, oh yeah, here's the Frank's casket again. I think it's the same image as the other one. Let me try to show you that one. It's slightly bigger. See? And so a lot of that I used to look at and f try to figure out what it was that they were saying and uh, the inscriptions were saying and what you can see is that, oh yeah, that's another really good one. 
And this is where you get into um, the, the mythological side of things. Let me see whether I can put that up close. See, it has a lot of imagery. And there's actually a rune inscription at the top right there. So, fascinating stuff. Historical, um, investigated, sorted, classified, blah, 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 blah. You know, about the culture trying to very carefully figure out what something means, what an object means. And the thing <laughs> crosses my mind at this moment, what we all used to uh, joke about back in the day, the students and I, was uh, one inscription that had been found actually on a soup bone from a location in Bergen in Norway uh, in a pub, I don't know, 14th century or earlier, I have no idea, I didn't look it up again. Nu er I hope I'm pronouncing that right, which means it's a whole lot of noise out here. So you can imagine from that, Somebody sitting there, you know, he's had his bowl of soup and slice of bread and he's carving that into his soup bone that he found inside his soup. There's a whole lot of noise out here because, you know, apparently everybody would come in at the same time and they were yelling and shouting and all that type of stuff. So, life, right? That's what these books are trying to get at also. So they were nice books. It's It's great to read them and it's... Um, it's the academic framework and I am finding it so hard that these are actually two different worlds compared to the magical approach and the witchy approach to runes and that's what I'm getting going to get to uh, next because so far you can order those books you can order them in translation these two are fairly old one of them is at least from the 70s or something so it's going way back and there's more, there's others, and it's just that the German, uh, there there have been quite a number of German authors um, in the early 20th century also. Dutch authors as well, uh, Scandinavian authors in the 19th century even, uh, writing and publishing about uh, this material, this type of material, because it was their homeland and they were interested in it, of course. They didn't necessarily, even the Germans didn't have to be, uh, you know, agreeing with the Nazi uh, mentality at all. That's really just that everybody in this field knows that the Nazis, uh, you know, pinched the, uh, the the solar symbol, you know, the Hakenkreuz wasn't theirs to use really. So I'm not into any of that. I'm not into, as you can, you know, of course, by now that I am not into any of the totalitarian political ideas at all, ever. So I'm just going to leave that to the side now. There's just this is a a set of approaches that has to do with historical artifacts and documents that have been investigated and analyzed, and that's it basically. And so there's a couple of bits and bobs where it gets slightly more interesting from the magical viewpoint. And Tacitus, who's a Roman author, uh, actually wrote that the Germans, the Germanics peoples, used uh, a, a rune oracle. And he's uh, sort of described that as being consisting of wooden sticks with a symbol on each, and that they use that to um, investigate uh, the occult, really, or the, uh, you know, try and make sense of their position or uh, tell the future. So that's Tacitus. He's actually written about that. That's actually... Uh, based in fact, and I think a lot of our originally in the in the in the past, I don't know, forty five fifty years or so, that the other approach. So getting back in some type of you know touch with the uh, occult side, trying to that's what I'm doing basically. I'm also trying to reel back in some type of understanding of the runes as a divinatory tool comparable to oracle, tarot 
and witches runes which aren't runes at all or Lenormand or any of it and apparently that's been my motivation all this time that's what I'm figuring out now it's like everything is sort of falling into place what I've been interested in I wasn't it's cool I can read this I'm comfortable with some of it but it leaves a great big gap after it has done describing whatever it's describing you know this inscription or that type of thing it's interesting because you can really get really close to the material from the 12th century or from the 9th century what have you and then nothing happens you see in terms of occult or esoteric uh, knowledge nothing more happens so there's you know of course there's always been a paranormal or an esoteric branch to science and in the 16th 17th 18th centuries when the first um, you know editions of the tarot started to come out and be printed and all that um, there wasn't really this enormous distinction between the academic and the occult that it was many of the leading figures in those days did both and mixed them up you know and wrote about uh, their material their subject material like uh, from all sorts of angles so the scientific and the alchemical didn't rule each other out it's that's a construct actually N yet again being you know from where I'm from and culturally and all that I have to stress that nowadays what we do is we uh, we approach things only from the almost 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 completely from the technological uh, viewpoint so it's we it's like we have to have this gap between the the occult the esoteric on the one hand and the um stuff you can actually prove and use and th i think that's important because the magic the approach to magic is a lot less about using um techniques materials symbols etc and that use being available regardless you know available to every single person whereas a smartphone anyone can use you can learn to use it it's just a couple of simple uh, processes that you have to learn and then you can use the smartphone you cannot use an alchemical symbol or a sigil necessarily as easily so maybe Maybe that's why it's important that all this focus has gone to technology, to science, to analysis and leaving the other half of the world, our experience basically, by the roadside. So my experience with runes as an oracle, okay, here goes. I have two sets of rune um, pebbles, what you call those coins okay this one is made of clay it's pottery i baked them i made i rolled them out like that and flattened them slightly and carved the runes into them and uh this is what that oops what that looks like we had a jumper right there they're a bit um they're not so sturdy so i have to really be careful that i don't crush them if I were to fall, let this fall on the floor, I would really crush them to a powder and all be gone. So that's not going to happen. Um, it's basically the same set of runes that I've been using uh, before this. I used to own, and I'm not sure whether I still got them or whether I actually got rid of them for some reason. My first ever set of a rune oracle used to be made of yew wood. And the thing about those was that I just had a set of yew branches, yew wood branches, about seven or eight millimeters in diameter, and I cut that up in little slices. But they were all different because I hadn't made sure beforehand that they would be equal in size and straight and more or less look, that they would actually look the same. They were rather different, they were wonky. So 
I, what then happened was that I got this set when my mother passed away. My mother sawed off these, all of them. So it, it's one of the very few actual creative um, things that she was engaged with for a longer period of time, one summer. I don't remember exactly when it was. Um, probably in the early 90s somewhere. And so I've got this set um, that are just perfect slices because that's how my mum, once she got around to actually doing something, she went ahead and did it properly. So there's a couple of other things in this set, in this bag. There's like uh, some little bits of stone that I can't really identify. There's a couple of these little cute little pine cones. And the rest of it is basically these, uh, see that? That's a Daga rune right there. And this is a yew rune. So this isn't yew wood. This is cypress wood that my mum got in the south of France. And they're actually uh, rather equal. And I'm suddenly deeply honoured that I've got them and that I have... Um, actually got something that she used to, she made, she decided for some weird reason that I can't explain, she decided that she wanted a set like this. And she spent, I don't know, a couple of days or so, uh, sewing them up really patiently in her way, the way she used to do things, and polishing them on the outside slightly. And that's what I had. There were no runes on them back in that time. So at one point, I decided that I was going to use hers, her sets rather than my own. I didn't even realize at the time that I wanted that because I wanted to feel her work in my hands. Now I can say that. Now I can tell the difference. And so it's of course it's because I know I was there when she made them, right? So what I did was I used a like a burning wood burning tool that you plug in the socket and it's like a soldering pin. I don't know what you call those tools in English. And I burnt the runes on them. And like this is a Hagal rune like that. See? And I put uh, the other uh, sort of the asterisk symbol on each back. So they are really the same. And they look really, they're really perfectly usable. As, a, as an oracle set. I haven't used them at hardly ever, you know. So a couple of years ago, maybe two or three years ago, I decided that I wanted another set that was separate from my mother's energy, I think. And that's when I made these, the clay ones, the pottery ones, okay? So I've got these two and that's it. And the other one, the old one with the made of yew wood, I am not sure. I still own that. I haven't seen it, I think, but I'm not sure because I didn't, I didn't, each time it was like, I'm interested in this system. I need stuff to work with the system as an oracle. And then what happened is I started doing that and I did a couple of spreads or I did a couple of casts and I didn't know what to do with the result of those because I didn't know how to properly interpret the runes as magical expressions of anything. Because all I had was the runology, the scientific knowledge, the passive, if you will, um, sense of what anything meant. There's another chapter to the knowledge of the runes from the historical viewpoint, and that's the runic poems. If you type that in in Google, you're going to get a ton of info, more than you want, probably. Uh, there's several um, medieval texts, manuscripts, also of the runic poems that have been found. And I think that actually almost all or practically all of the knowledge about runes that we use nowadays in the pagan witchy context comes originally from the rune poems. Yeah, so... But it doesn't state that because who cares? And it's old fashioned anyway. And that in combination with a couple of other 
um, Viking Age poems, you know, and stuff like that, you get uh, sort of this world, sort of this basic theme of a sense, I suppose what appeals to me about this is a sense of personal sovereignty, yes, and independence in a world that isn't necessarily going to play your game the way you want it. So, more can be said about that part of things, I think. And, but that's important. Where am I? Who am I? What am I? What kind of question am I asking? That type of thing, you know? That's what the runes are supposed to help you with. Same with Lenormand or any other kind of a, you know, or or oracular system. So yesterday, what I did basically is I drew a couple of runes. I came in out of the heat, and I had seen Lisa's video where she um, was, you know, talking about her um, rune cards that she was showing. And I went like, oh my god, this is the 15th time that I'm watching somebody getting all excited about runes. I'm gonna try and get a hold of my sets. They were back here, all nice and neat and organized. And I have a couple of little bags that I use to keep them in. And I've got a couple of, I've even got like a little goddess clay, uh, goddess symbol and uh, a bottle of lavender oil. And it's all very nice and neat and pretty, you know. I'm going to fish out the little owl goddess that I made age and a half ago. This one actually lived with the U rune set uh, also for a while. So it's still in here. The owl, uh, like the raven, you know, is to me always kind of symbolized. It was I was looking for the significance of things. And I was trying to make it up for myself what the runes meant to me and that didn't really work and the historical material i've got is only goes only so far you know etc it's just it's not really easy and a lot of the importance of certain runes is based around um a life that those people used to lead before the Middle Ages, you know, with nature and basically having to fend for themselves, hence the independence idea also, um, surrounded by forces that weren't necessarily on their side. Uh, and you were, so it was, it wasn't necessarily all nice and pretty. It wasn't, as of course the tarot isn't either. It's a lot of it is about um, figuring out, I suppose, your place in a world full of danger and uncertainty. So then again, I can make sense of that nowadays. And I can also see that that was a dimension, the dimension of danger and uncertainty, I wasn't going to be able to handle back in those days because not for nothing, I had to go through five or six years of soul retrieval and completion process work, you know, just sneaking my way <laughs> through um, a whole lot, a whole pile of personal growth and development before I could actually come back to this. And then, uh, again, what I have is a blank slate. What does the horse, the Eichur, rune? mean to me now what does the sky god rune mean to me now here he is that's one i had yesterday so i came in out of the heat yesterday okay and i took up my bags of little runes and i took out uh, i drew out four, four of the runes out of the one bag and set them in a row like that and it said something like um there's flies you know, <laughs> it said something like the sky god uh, is putting a brand in the sun. Something like that. You can make a, you can kind of string it up into a little story line or a, a phrase of some sort. The two, the answer, 
the god of the sky is powerful and the brand is in the sun the the sun is burning fiercely and it was and then i took out i pulled out a couple of runes from the other from my mother's uh, set to sort of see what they would give me you know and there was both the brand and the sun symbol coming uh, once more so it was like they were trying to communicate something to me something very obvious really because i tend to go off into wild unknown territory <laughs> no pun intended and and um, whereas basically i have, haven't really got a question i wasn't really asking anything i was just trying to see what the runes were telling me and they were just saying it's hot in it you know something like that hot and bright so after that of course i had to sort of complicate matters for myself again because it will never do when things are simple and I sort of tried to focus on what the sky god would actually mean to me. He later became uh, Mars, like a Martian, a war god type figure. That's something I don't relate to in the slightest. Um, maybe I do. I don't know. I don't think I, I like. I don't like a war a warrior imagery in the slightest. It's not my cup of tea. I know that there's places and times where you have to defend yourself. But there will always be like a necessity imposed upon you. And yesterday was otherwise completely peaceful. So as far as I could tell. So at least in my life. So I was like interested to see that there's actually the sky. But there is no earth rune is there. There's the sun as a rune but there's no moon as far as I know. You cannot, it's not linked up that easily with, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You get a birch rune and a yew rune for trees and that's it. It's like a seasonal, little summary of a seasonal calendar like you would get in the Ogham, you know, that type of thing. Where the birch and the yew, yew tree are actually represented in the Ogham tree calendar. And then there's a couple of other symbols and of course depending on which rune alphabet you're going to use um, because because there's more than one um, you'll have more choice but the rune poems that we go to for the original hypothetically historical meanings and the actual symbolic meanings that's all we've got it's all we've got is those rune poems and they're very basic and uh, they give you three lines each or two and a half lines or what have you per uh, symbol and there's kind of a little you know storyline or an explanation of some sort and uh, and that's it really so it's really flimsy it's flimsier than the I Ching ever is so I've always had a big problem with flimsiness I don't mind studying heaps of books I want to give me the you know I want somebody to tell me what this means so I will also start reading this uh, book. It says Rune Signs here. It's in Dutch. And it's a translation of a really witchy uh, book. It's really pretty. It's got a ton of right, really nice uh, photographs in it. It's by Francis Melville. And it has all sorts of pebbles and photographs and symbols. And is actually done... Uh, quite a bit of studying. Oh, and I opened the book, and here's the sky god, Tewas, right there. And he's got a wolf and all that type of pretty stuff, and an oak tree and all that. So I'll be reading this anyway in the coming week or so to while away the time until the holidays. And I'm already three quarters of an hour in. I was interested in presenting with you with these uh, are the, the two approaches really the oracular uh, personal experiential approach if that's a word where I have to start from scratch really scratch literally I'm not trying to be funny it's accidental sorry and maybe like with so many other things in life it's only after 50 that things start making sense and I'll have to, I'll have to, for myself, basically start organizing the runes into a, like they're supposed to represent the world, right? 
Because like the tarot represents most of the world. Because then it works. If you have an oracle that doesn't really link to the important bits, then it's not going to work, right? Like my rose oracle, I have no idea where that's going. But maybe I can combine things, you know, and make two halves of a system. That's what's so nice about the tarot. It's always, there's always a system. It doesn't matter which system you use. You can be sure and confident and at ease, yay, um, with the fact that there's somebody who's had, had thought out the system and whether the tower is the tower as in a Minchiati or a, or a, a Marseille deck or whether it's a Rider Waite Smith or a Thoth or a, you know, it doesn't matter how much you add on to that tower. It's basically, it's the tower and everyone knows that, oh dear, it's the tower. You don't really have that with the runes. I don't anyway. So great stuff, great fun. Um, it's hot, it's summer, we're reading and we're uh, trying to also, you know, draw up bits of knowledge and then potentially uh, write it all down maybe at some point and think about things. And uh, I'll report back to you whenever I have something insightful <laughs> to say about these things, okay? So stay cool, I'd advise. And uh, drink enough of water and drink enough, plenty, you know, make sure you're hydrated because I, uh, I have to. And um, I'll be talking again to you very soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching, you guys. See you. Bye-bye.